Good morning. Welcome. If you weren't here last night, I'd like to welcome you to um, the 22nd Annual Biennial uh, World Gifted Conference. We're happy to have you here, and I'm pleased to see so many um, people brave the cold weather this morning um, to make it out for uh, this morning's keynote. Before we get started, uh, well, um, the PowerPoint's not advancing. Oops. So, but we need to go through some housekeeping, so I'll just go through it um, while they get this taken care of. Um, there's a couple of things we want to make you aware of just to keep the um, conference moving smoothly. So, first of all, venues. There are Matthews Pavilions, which where um, all of your um, lunches and morning um, teas will be located. So there are eight lunch stations, so there's plenty of um, places to find your lunch. And so if one place looks crowded, just find another lunch station and um, grab your lunch. Um, and there are four coffee and tea stations, and there's one um, table set up for special dietary requests. Toilets, which are very important. Um, Clancy Foyer, two locations on level one Matthews. Level two in Matthews are near the stairs and the lifts. And there's um, toilets also in the Matthews food court. Unfortunately, Matthews Theaters C and D do not have weird, uh, wheelchair um, access. Also in Matthews is a lunchtime parenting network area, which is on Matthews Level 1. So if you're looking for um, a place to network with other parents, this is being um, coordinated by Carol Barnes. So please um, check that out if you're um, new to this conference or any conference uh, for gifted um, parents of gifted children. Safety and evacuation. If um, we do need to evacuate the building, you're to meet at the library lawn, um, and I believe that safety and evacuation piece is located in your program. Session chairs. So um, sessions, there is no reserved um, seating in sessions. It is a first come, um, first served basis. So each session is assigned a chair who is asked to introduce the session and keep time. Each parallel session is 25 minutes, including questions, and session chairs are assigned to the cluster of presentations in that parallel session. So we're asked that you please start and finish on time. Parallel sessions, so um, if you look through your program, are um, all three are um, clustered. So. In a parallel session, you'll see there are three presentations within that session. Also, if you're a session chair and did not receive um, your set of instructions in your badge, you would have gotten an email about whether you're going to be a session chair or not. If you could see the registration desk and they have your um, instructions for you. Um, program changes. There are some, and um, they are um, posted in the foyer um, in, in the Clancy Auditorium. Poster presentations. All posters will be on display in the Clancy foyer throughout the conference. Poster presentations 1 through 13 will be on Friday from 3.30 to 4 p.m. Poster presentations 14 through 27 will be on Saturday from 4 to 4.30. All posters need to be taken down after lunch on Sunday. Photography. Please note the photographers will be taking photos during this conference in and around the conference area. So UNSW and um, WCGTC intend to use these photographs for its promotional and editorial purposes, including using them on various websites, um, including the UNSW website and on social media. So if you don't want to have your photograph um, used in this way, please let us know and we will um, make sure that your photograph does not get um, taken or used in the, for these purposes. And we want to thank our exhibitors and our sponsors. So um, exhibitor stands are located in the Matthews Pavilions. 
throughout the conference, and there is also um, a gift stand that you can purchase UNSW merchandise in the pavilions during lunch breaks um, Friday to Sunday. Wi-Fi, which we also um, have provided throughout the conference, Wi-Fi registration was sent to all attendees via email. You can log into UniWide Network and then see the Wi-Fi desk behind Clancy Auditorium on Friday morning for help from 8 to 11.30. Um, school or board business devices can encounter issues, um, and your personal uh, Wi-Fi devices tend to have fewer issues. Accreditation and participation. So if you are from New South Wales and you're attending and you would like to get NESA accreditation, you will need to sign in at the start of each day in the Clancy foyer on Friday and the back of Clancy on Saturday and Sunday. We will log um, your hours for you if we have your number, and you can email us at education.events at unsw.edu.au. Certificates of attendance for international attendees can be collected um, during lunch breaks Friday to Sunday, and certificates of attendance for Australian registrants um, can be available um, on request at education.events at unsw.edu.au. So if you need any assistance throughout the conference, event team, uh, events teams with yellow lanyards and uh, green volunteer bibs, you would have seen these um, volunteers this morning uh, re helping with registration. They'll be uh, available throughout the conference. First aid kits are available at the registration desk at Clancy Foyer on Friday and the back of Clancy on Saturday and Sunday. And in an emergency, contact the UNSW campus emergency at 9385-6666. And then we, all, uh, we ask all attendees to wear their lanyards, name tags, at, the time, uh, at all times during the conference. All right. So... Without further ado, we'd like to get the conference kicked off this morning um, with our first keynote speaker. And to introduce our keynote, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jay Jung. Thank you. Good, good morning. Um, thank you, Jennifer. Um, welcome to the first formal day of proceedings at the um, 22nd Biennial um, World Gifting Conference. It's so good to see all of you here from different parts of the world. I hope you make the most of this invaluable opportunity to um, engage with others uh, with a passion for gifted education from around the world. Uh, before I go any further, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which this event is taking place and recognise their continuing connection to land, water, and community. I pay respect to elders past, present, and emerging. It is my pleasure to um, introduce you to Mark Scott, who is the secretary of the New South Wales Department of Education, and who has a distinguished record uh, in public service, education, and the media. His career began um, as a school teacher in Sydney, and then he built on his interest um, in education with senior policy and leadership positions um, with two New South Wales education ministers. He also held a number of senior editorial roles uh, with Fairfax, including the role of education editor of the Sydney Morning Herald. Um, in 2011, uh, he was named an officer of the Order of Australia. Um, the title of his presentation today is Delivering on the Promise of Potential. Please join me in welcoming Mark Scott. Well, uh, thank you, Jay, and ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good, to be, uh, good to be with you in chilly Sydney. I understand that the last symposium was held in Denmark. <laughs> Who knew Sydney would be cooler? Um, <clears throat> But still wonderful to, wonderful to have you all here. I'd like to also acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land in which we meet and to pay my respect to elders past and present and to extend that respect to all other Aboriginal people here today. Now, New South Wales public education has a long history of promoting academic excellence and creating opportunities for gifted students 
irrespective of their background. And our specialist school system for gifted and talented students is internationally regarded as a model of best practice and per capita one of the most intensive models in OECD countries. And today I want to explore that model a little bit more deeply. And I think if you're a visitor to New South Wales or a visitor to Australia, the kind of model that has been developed here uh, over the last century or so, and intensively over the last quarter century or so, means it's a very interesting system, I think, that we are running here, and um, one worthy of your exploration, and one that we are continuing to consider and to evaluate and review on the evidence that comes to life. Our specialist schools and classes cater for gifted and talented students who have high academic ability, matched by exceptional classroom performance and they provide intellectual and academic challenge through enrichment, extension and curriculum differentiation and group together gifted and talented students who may otherwise be isolated from a suitable peer group. Look, and this has shaped the future of many prominent high achievers among our alumni who are proud graduates of public selective schools and have excelled in law, medicine, science, politics, sport, creative and performing arts. We count among the alumni of our selective schools, prime ministers and premiers, Nobel laureates, Olympians, and many other outstanding Australians. And as I understand it, even the occasional underworld figure as well. Although uh, when I was recently at Fort Street High, I didn't see Abe Saffron's name on the honour boards. That was a line for, for the locals. In local parlance, Mr. Saffron was a well-known Sydney racing identity. Our system of selective schools and opportunity classes is part of the Department of Education's commitment that all students will have the opportunity to work towards their potential through schools, curriculum and teaching that meets their needs. The New South Wales Education Act of 1990, the Act of Parliament that outlines the provision of education in our state, makes it clear that every person concerned is to have regard to assisting each child achieve his or her education potential, as well as the provision of opportunities to, student, to children with special abilities. But still we face the challenge, like all education systems, of preparing young minds to meet uncertainties, trials and rapid change that is coming at us in the 21st century. And we're also attempting to arrest the national trend of a dip in performance among our highest achievers. Our gifted and talented education policy is currently under review and I'm going to talk later about some of the new directions that we're going to be taking. And the review is informed by an analysis of student achievement data and a review of international and national research and an extensive consultation process. Our system offers a suite of specialist schools that seek to develop talent in high potential students. Families can choose to apply for a position at an academically selective class or school. Students are selected on the balance of an ability test and a school recommendation, with the selective schools test made up of reading, mathematics, general ability and a writing component. Schools also submit marks based on students' academic achievements. Our system has 19 fully selective high schools where students are largely sec selected via an academic test. 29 partially selective uh, schools, where selective classes operate alongside a comprehensive intake of students enrolled from the local area. We have 76 primary schools with opportunity classes, or OCs as we call them, for gifted and talented year five and six students aged between nine and 12. We have nine creative and performing arts highs, seven specialist sports highs, one specialist music high school, the Conservatorium High School. And all of this forms part of a public school system that's one of the largest in the world, with around 800,000 800, students in more than 2,200 schools, covering 809,000 square kilometres in the state of New South Wales. The basis of what we know as selective schools grew out of the education reform movement at the end of the 19th century. In the United States and Great Britain, there was an emerging interest in, edu in educational psychology and pedagogy, the emerging priority of technical education, and a concern 
especially in Scotland, to transcend social class boundaries by providing avenues for the available poor, for the able poor to obtain the education they deserve. The foundation in New South Wales for the early academic high schools was under the 1880 Public Instruction Act and the vision of the then Premier, Henry Parks. He said that education was the passport to social mobility via free, secular and compulsory education for all. Advanced technical schools were established based on the recommendations of the 1903 New South Wales Royal Commission into Education which found that at the time education was not equipping bright young minds with an understanding of the advanced science and technology which would shape the next century. These are words that sound so familiar to us today. Arguing the case to establish the system of public selective schools accessible to all students irrespective of their backgrounds, the first principal of Sydney Technical High School wrote that every individual has the, has the right to release himself. That is to fully develop the power and capabilities, physical, mental, moral and spiritual with which nature endowed him. Fort Street High is the oldest selective high school in New South Wales, established in 1849, and a series of others, including Sydney Girls and Sydney Boys, Hurlston, Sydney Technical High School, were all established through to the middle of the First World War. These were some of our first secondary schools, and the term selective wasn't used until the 1950s. The idea of secondary schooling in the late 19th and early 20th centuries would only have been considered by a small minority of students and their families. Now today's model of an expansive number of selective schools had its origins in the election of the Greiner government in 1988. And around this time, education underwent a restructuring based on a market orientation, intending to stimulate competition between schools, principally through increased specialisation. The opening up of choice and diversity for parents within the government school system. This philosophy responded to a declining status of government schools in the public mind and major reports at the time recommended the dezoning of schools to allow parents to choose the most appropriate government school for their child and the establishment of more selective high schools. Now at this time there were four agricultural selective high schools and seven selective high schools and the system of fully selective high schools was expanded to meet the growing size of Sydney, especially in outer suburbs and lower socioeconomic status areas. At that time, really the selective high schools were based in the eastern part of the city. Selective high schools were added to comprehensive schools in order to meet the full needs of the city. And in addition, to the system of selective high schools in sports, performing arts and creative arts were added to the mix and schools like Westfield Sports High School has a long history in helping many Australian Olympians and sports people reach the top. People such as the Australian cricket captain Michael Clark and footballers like Sarah Walsh and Harry Kuehl. The Conservatorium High School, a specialist high school connected to the Sydney Conservatorium of Music, is unique in that students undergo musical performance auditions and academic selection processes for entry with large cohorts of students accelerating through both music and mathematics courses each year. Now there's been more of a doubling of fully selective academic high schools since 1988, expanded on a bipartisan basis in New South Wales politics, and the introduction of 29 hybrid partially selective schools. Now in 2015, Australia's first virtually selective school, Aurora College, began enrolling students from regional, rural and remote parts of the state. And Aurora College is worth a brief detour today because it's a new model that's helping us overcome the disadvantage of geographical remoteness to gifted students. And it's providing innovative, flexible learning to a whole new context by allowing students to collect locally and to learn globally. Aurora offers selective classes in English, mathematics and science to gifted and talented year seven to 10 students from rural and remote areas across New South Wales. In 2017, Aurora shares students with 68 rural and remote schools. 
lost my Aurora slide. Um, now these students come from all corners of New South Wales, from Mwilimba uh, in the north to Eden in the south, from west to Broken Hills, and you can see, uh, uh, let me see if I can find this slide, there it is, my fault, uh, and you can see the spread of students from Aurora uh, all across the slide. Now if, you, if you're new to Australia, new to New South Wales, you need to have an understanding of the vastness of the distances here. So Broken Hill in the west, if we started driving now and we didn't break, we'd get to Broken Hill at about 11 o'clock tonight. It's 1,200 kilometres away. So there's um, one, one of the most famous books on Australian history was entitled The Tyranny of Distance. And Australia has a vast population. Australia's population is overwhelmingly uh, uh, distributed around the coastal areas. And so if you are in a place like Broken Hill, you are so isolated, and what Aurora College is really designed to do is help you overcome that disadvantage. And so you can see the spread of students and of teachers and where students and teachers are working together. Aurora provides a mix of online and residential school classes. Students connect with their teachers and classmates in timetabled lessons through a virtual learning environment, which includes web conferencing software, a learning management system, a range of cutting edge online communication and collaboration tools. Now we know and often hear that social isolation is an issue for gifted students and this is particularly so in rural and remote areas. So at Aurora College there's a virtual playground. The students' faces are their avatars and they're beamed into the playground through webcams so they can chat and move around and join groups and it's been a wonderful uh, initiative. The rationale for the increase uh, in selective schools since 1988 was to provide more diversity and choice to parents and students, especially in the areas that had limited access to such students. We know that research supports the use of ability grouping structures for gifted students and that their use helps to facilitate differentiation and acceleration. It ensures that schools can specialise in the delivering of teaching and support programs to help meet the needs of gifted students. Working with like minds helps students to make strong social and working relationships, many of which will uh, exist in life long after school. Selective schools have provided a reputational advantage to public education in New South Wales. HSC results each year clearly show the highest performing schools in New South Wales out of all government and non-government schools, including high fee independent schools. The highest performing schools are New South Wales government selective schools. We don't encourage and endorse the academic league tables created by the media, but they are a fact of life. And they show that one selective school, James Roos Agricultural High School, has topped the state in every HSC every single year for the past 20 years. Now I know that some students from uh, James Roos are here today. I've told them that I'm just their warm-up act. They are speaking later and you'll value hearing their insights about what it's like to join these school, this school and to be part of this community. The top 10 list in the HSC every year is dominated by public selective schools and one of uh, the city's leading vice-chancellors, I was asking him recently about the progress of students into university and the extent to which HSC is a good predictor of future success. He indicated to me by far the greatest predictor of future success and acceleration through university is the pathway of students who've come through New South Wales government selective high schools. They do very well at school. They continue to do very well in a higher education setting. Now, as you'd expect, given these results and outcomes, demand for entry into these schools is high. This year, 13,000, effectively 13,500 students attempted the selective school test for slightly more than 4,000 academically selective year seven places in these schools. Now, in our department, we think it's critical that all schools are able to set high expectations and extend all students so they can work to their potential. And of course we understand that not all gifted students are in our selective schools or opportunity classes. Many are doing brilliantly in government comprehensive high schools, whilst there'll be many others that have not been currently identified as gifted. Now our gifted and talented policy was introduced 
in 2004 and at that time set the standard in Australia for its comprehensive package of support materials and professional learning. Identification, differentiation, grouping and acceleration all formed part of the suite of options available to help schools to meet the needs of students, of their brightest students. The 2004 policy development was led by Dr Angela Chessman and included Emeritus Professor Mirika Gross and her team here at the University of New South Wales hosting us this week. Professor Gross's research into exceptionally gifted students, academic acceleration and social development saw her contribute strongly to the development of the gifted education research field in Australia and internationally. The 2004 policy improved on the earlier 1983 and 1991 state policies and established Gagne's differentiated model of gifted and talented as the central conceptual understanding of giftedness. Gifted as the potential or the raw materials and talent, the outstanding achievement of the finished product. We are currently reviewing the 2004 policy. New South Wales public schools have led the way in providing for high potential students, regardless of their postcode or social background. In revising the 2004 policy, we recognise that socioeconomic status is an increasingly large factor in educational achievement in Australia and one where public schools must carry the highest burden. Our understanding of what works best in teaching and learning has greatly improved in recent decades. Our Centre for Educational Statistics and Evaluation, the state's authority on education research, analyses our student achievement and synthesises the research literature on effective practices in education. An analysis of student achievement data shows us that not all gifted and high potential students are doing as well as they could be and this is the case across Australia, with significant excellence gaps apparent for students from low socioeconomic or refugee backgrounds and from rural and remote areas. Newer research into conceptualising talent development has helped us better understand why some students are underachieving and what we can do about it to support their talent development. Of great concern nationally is the slide in performance among our high achievers on international and national assessments. Now this graph tracks the percentage of students achieving in the high achievement range, the top two bands, on the three PISA test components from 20, uh, 2000 to 2015. And it shows a general decline across the nation of 17% for reading, 20% for mathematics, and 15% for science. Down from those levels, down to 11% for all three in 2015. And high SES students have recorded the most notable drop in maths achievement. The graph shows the percentage of, uh, this graph shows the percentage of students who achieved at the advanced benchmark for year eight science in TIMS in 2015. The advanced performance band is the highest band for TIMS and you can see here that New South Wales is behind some major English speaking economies such as the United States and England, and well behind major, major Asia, um, Asian high achievers. We can make an argument that in our selective schools and across the state, many of our high achievers are doing very well, but we need to ask the question, are they doing well enough? And, and the, the challenge continues when we look at this slide. This graph shows the percentage of students reaching the advanced achievement benchmark for TIMS 2015 Year 8 Science sorted by GDP per capita. High figures show that a country has a very high percentage of high achieving students compared to their GDP per capita, and so this puts a spotlight on emerging economies like Kazakhstan and Hungary. Strong Asian economies like Japan and Singapore, still with very high GDP, hold up very well. But Australia and New South Wales with a very high GDP but lower percentages of high achievers are down the bottom of this graph and we are behind many English speaking economies. So if New South Wales was a nation, it would rate 18th in year eight science on the basis of straight achievement, but 31st out of 38 countries when GDP is taken into account. GDP of course is an indicator of economic output and is strongly related to levels of higher education, 
research output and technology development. So really there should be a relationship between GDP and academic high performance. And here's another graph that goes to the heart of our equity concerns. It shows the percentage of students at the PISA Maths High Achievement range recorded by Aboriginality and shows the visible gap between non-Indigenous and Indigenous students. Now there's been some improvement in student results for Aboriginal students from 2012 to 2015, but that gap, by any criteria, by any thinking, in any perspective, remains too wide. So across many measures, I think we can see that not enough high potential Australian students are achieving their academic potential. We recognise that student underachievement is a significant problem, not just limited to gifted students, but also to high potential students who are above the average range, but may not be in our selective classes or schools. In preparing for our new gifted education policy, we commissioned the Centre for Educational Statistics and Evaluation to produce a literature review on the gifted and gifted education evidence base, which was no small challenge. And that evidence base is going to support the development of a new policy and will be part of the professional learning support package. We aim to use the strong research work of many of the many assembled here to ensure that our practices are informed by the very best evidence base available. We've gone through all the major research of the past decade to help build a strong evidence base on which to build our policy. We've been influenced by the work of many of the great researchers in this field, field names well known to you. Research by Jonathan Plucker and Scott Peters into excellence and equity gaps as well as Carolyn Callaghan's work with Plucker on effective practices in gifted uh, education. Susan Azzeline, Nicholas Colangelo, Karen Rogers and Mirica Gross into economic acceleration, the late John Geek's pioneering work on the neuroscience of high ability, Carol Dweck and Angela Duckworth's research into mindset and grit needed to achieve at the highest levels. And we also recognise and are grateful for the strong research work by Australian academics such as Vilma Vallier, Jay Jung, Susan Smith and John Mungro, among many others who continue to work tirelessly to help inform teaching and learning in Australia and internationally. Our policy review process has incorporated one of the broadest programs of community and professional engagement and has so far involved more than 40 consultation sessions and more than 150 voices and the opinions and advice are remarkably similar to the literature review we've undertaken on international best practice. And I want to thank all those involved here who've been so generous in their time and their insights in helping us come to an understanding about where our policy needs to move to and our understanding where the best research should lead us. So what are we recognising? We're recognising that all our schools need to work hard to ensure that best practices for gifted students are part of their core business and that we expect the best for all students. And despite having one of the strongest evidence bases in education, acceleration as a tool is still underutilised in our schools. The particular needs of highly exceptional and extremely gifted students must be acknowledged and attended to better. There are equity concerns at the low representation of groups of gifted learners, gifted students with disability, Aboriginal students, refugee students and low SES students. High potential students, those who may not meet the more advanced criteria for giftedness but who still possess a high level of academic potential are often missed in our schools. And this may be a tr um, contributing to a broader level of underachievement. The inclusion of gifted education subjects in pre-service pre teacher training is widely supported by practitioners and by research, but is rarely mandatory in pre-service teacher education courses, a real problem. Greater professional learning for all teachers and school leaders, especially for teachers working in specialist selective settings, is needed to equip teachers with the skills to help meet the learning needs of brighter students. 
I was chatting with Jay beforehand, and he was giving me a quick rundown of things that we needed to be doing, and I was reflecting on our remarks today, and I was ticking the box as he was telling me where the consensus and where the thinking is. And I think we've learned a lot from your insights, and our policy, as you see it, at the end of the year will reflect that. We have a long history of academic excellence in New South Wales public schools, but we know we need to do more to improve and to improve the learning outcomes of the children in our care. Now let's move into a little contentious issue. In New South Wales public schools, there are three components of the placement process for entry into a selective school at year seven. Sitting the selective high school placement test, primary school student scores in English and mathematics, and deliberations by a selection committee that includes a principal and a parent. Uh, now, my team here was suggesting that we were going to put up a few questions from the selective school tests uh, to, to quiz you on this morning. Uh, I was frightened that the James Roos students would just show us all up. I was also concerned that no one would listen to anything I had to say and instead do the test. So, but but um, you'll see some sample ones online. The test um, consists of a 20-minute writing test and, and three 40-minute multiple choice questions in reading, mathematics and general ability, and it's developed by the Australian Council of Educational Research. Now, we've long had an academically challenging process for selecting students into our advanced program. The current procedure for identifying students for academic selective places was introduced in secondary schools way back in 1989 and for primary OCs in 1996. Now, as the research has moved and improved, as the technology has improved, we need to look and see if there are better ways to assess the academic achievement and potential of our brightest students. As a local issue, we recognise that an industry of private tutoring colleges has developed over time, where families can pay extra money to independent businesses to do extra test practice for the OC and selective school exams. We cannot talk about reviewing gifted and talented policy without looking at the role of family motivation and the influence of the tutoring industry. There are many different views on tutoring and it's consistently a controversial topic in the media and discussions over espressos in Sydney. <laughs> I'm advised there's limited empirical research about whether tutoring is effective in improving the chances of a student being accepted into a selective setting, but research genuinely generally supports the notion that extensive test practice and preparation may provide an advantage in gaining a high score on tests. There is, however, significant community perception that tutoring is necessary for successful entry, um, and that might be a filtering process. And we understand that parents can spend more than $20,000 a year on preparation for OC and selective high school tests. Estimates place that the size of the school tutoring business at well over $1 billion annually. Now, as the coaching boom continues, we are seeing a decline of low SES students gaining access into selective schools. And it isn't difficult to join the dots. It's not difficult to join the dots. Less than 3% of students in our selective school settings are drawn from the lowest socioeconomic status quartile. Less than 3%. And this is a marked decline over the past decades. But we know from research that gifted and talented individuals are found across all socioeconomic levels, from all cultures and from more all parts of the country. Current evidence suggests that academic ability must, should be much more evenly distributed across all social and cultural groups than is reflected today in the demographic composition of our selective schools. And this is the same in our selective schools as is the case for many gifted education programs internationally. We also know from research that disadvantaged and minority populations are highly underrepresented in many international gifted education programs. In Australia, students from low SES backgrounds are increasingly less likely to achieve at the top end than students in the middle or top quartiles. Analysis of PISA and TIMS data 
uh, shows that in Australia, nearly six times as many students from the top SES quartile achieving the highest band on international test results compared to the bottom SES quartile. What we would like to do in New South Wales is explore how we can ensure that bright students have a chance to reach and exceed their potential regardless of their postcode. And so we're going to ask the question whether we need to look at other models of selection for our selective schools and classes. Assessment has advanced considerably since we developed our entry test procedures. Alternative models include computer adaptive IQ tests that assess cognitive skills, student work portfolios that show achievement in curriculum over time, problem solving tasks that rely more on higher order and critical thinking skills, all of which are harder to prepare for than through tutoring and test familiarisation and potentially would be better indicators of the types of skills needed for the 21st century. Reviewing our gifted uh, student identification and selection processes will ensure we are committed to the principles of our education system that all students in all schools have the opportunity to reach their academic potential. Now I don't need to tell this learned gathering that models of giftedness vary around the world and in Australia. In the current working definition used in Australia, gifted constitutes the top 10% of potential in a population. But we recognise that gifted students are not a homogeneous group. They incorporate students whose ability is exceptionally advanced for their age, but also gifted students with disability that may make their learning experience even more challenging. Our new policy will continue to use Gagné's differentiated model of gifted and talented, that to get a student from giftedness to talented requires a process of talent development, formal and informal learning plus time and practice and feedback. It will focus on gifted students as the students in our classroom and talent development as part of the role schools must play to help all students reach their potential. The policy will, for the first time, incorporate high potential students, students above the average range who have the potential to achieve highly. This would include a broad range of students who are underachieving or may have gifted out, who may have missed out on identification as gifted students. We want to make it clear in our policy that all schools will have a critical mass of students above the average range students who need to be challenged and supported. To make it clear we're not redefining giftedness, the policy will differentiate between high potential and gifted as part of a group of students who need support but with differences in their needs. This will help strengthen our provisions for high potential students who may need more in the way of curriculum differentiation and enrichment while making clear how stronger measures such as academic acceleration and selective schools are of greater benefit for more highly gifted students. The policy will make it clear that high potential students and gifted students require specific learning strategies and supportive learning environment to facilitate their talent development. All schools across the state continue to have a responsibility to develop and deliver robust and rigorous differentiated learning experiences that extend and enrich every student. Our objectives are to support all schools to create a, criti a critical mass of students who are aspiring to high achievement, high expectations of all learners. We want to promote the use of research and evidence as the basis for decision making and action in all schools and classrooms. And publications like CC's What Works Best and the use of student achievement and diagnostic data will help teachers make informed decisions on how best to meet the learning needs of high potential and gifted students. Formative assessment, that strong driver of student growth and learning will feature strongly as a way of ensuring that students get a sense, that schools get a sense of where students have already achieved mastery to help avoid repetition and boredom in class. Now, in conclusion, I've framed a few key themes here today in terms of our commitment to improving equity, extending the identification of gifted and high potential students, and to make it very clear that all schools have a responsibility to identify and nurture these students. Our policy is still being finalised, but will, will include these key elements. 
the strengthened, explicit reference to the differing needs of highly, exceptionally and profoundly gifted students, that is, students whose intelligence is rarer than one in a thousand through to one in 10,000 and beyond. To support these students, we will revise and strengthen our guidelines for academic acceleration. The overwhelming evidence base of the academic, social and personal benefits of acceleration are too hard to ignore. The first explicit policy reference will be made in this statement to the needs of gifted students with disability. The policy will clearly connect their advanced learning needs with student disability services and requirements under legislation. The policy will have stronger inclusion of selective and OC schools. And it will recognise for the first time that specialist high schools, sports, design, creative and performing arts and the, performing arts and the conservatorium are talent development centres that specialise in their particular domain of talent. The policy will dovetail with our philosophy in public education in New South Wales, and that is that we want every student, every teacher, every school, every leader to improve every year. We are preparing young people to live rewarding lives in an increasingly complex world. Many experts are predicting that technological developments, including advances in artificial intelligence, robotics and automation, are going to transform the way we live and work on a scale similar to the Industrial Revolution. So the future work skills our students need will be enhanced through authentic, real-world learning and learner-led forms of inquiry. And research tells us that we need to understand in that world our learners will inherit the work skills that they will need to navigate in their world effectively. The profound changes ahead demand an education approach that lifts the proficiency of all students. As Dylan William has said, our world is becoming more and more complex and so higher and higher levels of education and achievement will be needed to be in control of one's life to understand one's culture, to participate meaningfully in democracy and to find fulfilling work. And this is critical for all of us because the five-year-olds who started in kindergarten this year will join this university in 2030 and spend most of their working lives in the second half of the 21st century. It's always been the case that our schools hold the future within their classroom but today's education systems need to set the foundations for these young people to live and thrive and work in 2050 and perhaps all the way through to 2020, 2090. The future is not an abstract concept for educators. It is alive in the faces of the children in our classrooms today. Such is the pace of change wrought by advancing technologies that it's highly conceivable that these young children will be living in a world radically different from our own. We welcome the high level insight from the experts in this room, the learnings that will be presented here in coming days, and I can assure you that your work will feed into our thinking and our policy development. Future thinking and planning for the future matters now more than ever before, and it means that we can't just keep doing what we've always been doing. Thank you very much.